my name is Dr. Scott Friedman, and I want to welcome everybody uh, to our seminar today. Today, I have the uh, privilege of uh, introducing Dr. Kelly uh, A. James, LPC, who brings a background of psychology and mental health clinical experience, having worked in the field in a variety of positions since 1997. She focuses her research, presentations, and training interests on the neurobiology of trauma, how trauma impacts the individual, child therapy, with an emphasis on parenting skills, quantum physics, and energetic healing. Dr. James was named the 2019-2020 Top Mental Health Professional by the International Association of Top Professionals. She has a weekly radio show the same name as the trauma book she co-authored, Why Aren't You Over This By Now, on boldbravemedia.com. She is a certified trauma professional, a child and adolescent trauma professional, national board certified counselor, certified emotion code practitioner, certified body code practitioner, certified life coach, a professional coach, registered play therapist and a supervisor and EMDR, EMDR trained and a licensed professional uh, counselor and licensed professional counselor supervisor. Dr. James has presented on trauma related issues on the local state, regional, national and international level since 2004 and she is an associate, uh, I'm sorry, affiliate professor <coughs> Counselor Program in Regilo, Italy. Dr. James was uh, fortunate to work as a clinical supervisor for the Children's Program at Green County Behavioral Health in collaboration with Dr. Bruce Perry, Senior Fellow, Child Trauma Academy in Houston. Dr. Perry is a world-renowned child trauma professional, and his model is the neurosequential model of therapeutics which helps inform clinicians to understand how trauma impacts brain development and how to grow the brain up after traumatic experiences. Dr. James' responsibility was to design and oversee implementation of the NMT in the Head Start classrooms. Dr. James earned her Bachelor of Science from the University of Arkansas, master's degrees from Oral Roberts University, and a PhD in counselor education and supervision from Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, so it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. James and, and, uh, and her work, uh, including uh, the article that I uh, had the pleasure of reading recently, The Scars You Can't See, really uh, resonates with the uh, background that I had in psychodynamic training where I learned that uh, childhood residue is what often we deal with uh, with adults and that trauma really uh, remains as a kind of freeze frame in the brain. And so uh, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. James and uh, I will be tracking the uh, questions that folks are asking that we'll address uh, after her presentation. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I think to start off with is the title of the book, Why Aren't You Over This By Now? Uh, my co-author, Dr. Su or Susan Bachman, she and I talked frequently about um, clients coming in and the amount of time we had to do psychoeducation and explaining um, that they weren't responsible for what had happened to them as children. And we just spent so much time doing that, that we felt like we were missing a component and being able to just move into therapy, which I know there's psychoeducation as part of therapy, but we wrote this book as a way for clients to be able to read it and um, see that their experiences were not their fault and then what to do about it, how, what treatments to seek to be able to heal and integrate their memories. So I want to tell you a story about Sam. And Sam was a client of, that 
came into my office and the way I had my office set up is I had a lobby and you'd walk through a door and there would be the adult office. And then you would walk through another door behind the chairs, which would be the playroom and then out another door to, to exit. So it was like a U shape. <clears throat> and so she comes in and hands me a piece of paper and it's written very, very small print. And as I'm reading this, I can see her leg bouncing. I mean, she is just like bouncing. And I just instinctively knew, I said, would you like to see what's in the rest of the office in that door behind us while I read this? And she said, yes. And so I could hear her going into the different rooms. I had a sand tray room, I had a storage room. And so she was doing all of that. And as I'm reading this, she says, you're the fourth therapist I've seen. The first two therapists said that I was too much and that my problems could not be resolved. The third therapist I liked, but she moved out of state. And so you're the fourth one. So if you don't hate me yet, I will tell you more of my story. And so over the course of time that I saw her, little pieces of the story would come out. And this is a person that was in their 30s and at the age of five, her father started sexually abusing her. At age six, he started taking her to the best I could um, ascertain was, would be a warehouse and they would have makeshift rooms built and they would put all these young girls in the middle and all these men would bid on these girls and then they would take them to these makeshift rooms and do what they wanted with them for the duration. And so her dad was the instigator of that and he took her at least weekly, sometimes twice a week until she was 18. And she was able to escape by going to college. And so now in her 30s, the issue she has is that she can't, um, she has to have bookcases in front of her windows. She has to live on the second floor and she barricades herself. She doesn't sleep maybe two hours a night. She does have a therapy dog, but the most she can sleep is about two hours at a time because then the nightmares start and the night terrors. So she is completely exhausted She's hyper vigilant to every single sound. Like every time the air conditioner would turn on, the, the filters would like lift up and she would jump. Noises outside of the building, she would jump. It took us months and months and months for her to have some semblance of calm. There were many sessions that we did where we would go in the playground, the playroom, and she would just pace the playroom as I'm talking to her about breathing, breathe, breathe, check yourself. We did many, many sessions like that. And so this is just one instance of what trauma does to someone. And she wasn't able to do EMDR because it was too, um, too much for her. She never was able to get to EMDR. So you might ask, what is trauma? And people think they know trauma, especially um, people outside of this field. They think trauma is physical abuse or sexual abuse. And Dr. Perry says trauma is anything that's prolonged, overwhelming, or unpredictable. And if you think about it, how many of us have had things that were prolonged, overwhelming, or unpredictable? And so trauma is anything that is a pattern of experiences or experiences that impairs our functioning, our stress response system that makes us more reactive or sensitive. And I'll show you later on on how this um, happens in our brain. And Dr. Peter Levine says trauma is perhaps the most avoided, ignored, belittled, denied, misunderstood, and untreated cause of human suffering. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Dr. Vanderkolk, and he says it's unbearable and intolerable. And so the trauma literature talks about big T traumas and small T traumas. And 
A lot of times people miss those small T traumas, which can be just as devastating to a person. So big T traumas are the things that many people experience, like a 9-11 or the Waco um, assault. So many things, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, small T traumas can be you know, being criticized, being in the lunchroom and you spill your lunch tray and everyone laughs at you. That can be a small T trauma that stores in your body system and then you have reactions out of it. So the concepts of trauma, the three E's. So it's again, an individual that experiences event or a series of events or a set of circumstances that are experienced by an individual, either physically, emotionally harmful, it can be life-threatening, it can be perceived as life-threatening that has long lasting effects on a person's functioning either you know, we have many different areas that we function physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. So these are the three E's of trauma. So again, it can be a single event or it can be repeated. It can be a perceived threat. If someone perceives they're at, in danger, it can create a trauma memory in the body. It's actual threat threat. It can be extreme threat. It can be physical. It can be psychological experiences. We all know that we perceive things based on our own experiences, our life experiences, and our perception of events. I've had clients who've been hit once and they're basket cases. They take a lot of work to heal what they need to heal. And then I've had others who've been beaten repeatedly for a long period of time and they seem to be doing okay. And so it's also our perception of those events. And it's the meaning, the label that we apply to those experiences. And it creates this why me, this questioning because it creates powerlessness in us. And then the effect. It can be immediate, it can be delayed, it can be long term. And so it just depends on how all of these fit together that then determine the amount of PTSD, the trauma memories that we store. And so these are the stages. So immediate reactions to the effects of trauma. You can have that blunted affect, you can be angry, agitation, numbness, dissociation. Dissociation always gets a bad rap but dissociation is a way for your body to keep yourself safe. So it's, it's actually a good thing. I had a client who was repeatedly raped by her um, husband and she would dissociate into the fan. She, she, she would become the fan blades to make it through what he was doing to her. It was the, what her, her brain's way of keeping her alive. So delayed reaction, you can have that continuous distress. You can have recall, those intrusive recall memories. This is what Sam had. She just had constant recall. So every noise that wasn't familiar to her, it would trigger her back to being abused. And then the long lasting reactions, fatigue. This is definitely Sam, she sleep disturbance and we all know that how hard it is to function in daily life and go to work and maintain some semblance of normalcy when you don't sleep. We all need a certain amount of sleep and you can't function well without that. And you also avoid things. You avoid social interactions. This was Sam. She would avoid things. She would avoid activities. The only activities she participated in were the things that she could take her dog with and that they were solitary. So she really didn't have friends per se. So this is just an example, uh, a slide I got off the internet of what happens with trauma events. So these are just different things. And part of um, the way I've created this presentation is awareness and how we view things. And a lot of times in our field, we look at the symptoms and not the root, and we have to do that really um, detailed intake and understand what's happened to someone, the root cause of the behaviors like gambling, like depression, like restlessness, and people who have interpersonal conflict. 
if we just look at the symptom of the interpersonal conflict without looking at the root cause. So it's really important to look at the root cause of issues that clients bring to us. And again, I'm not going to go over this really well. If anyone wants this PowerPoint, just email Carly and I will email this to her. And so she will give it to you and you can um, look more closely at this. The one thing on this I did want to point out is that trauma creates a loss of safety and we don't feel safe. And so we are always looking, we're hyper vigilant for those danger cues. Uh, Dr. Vanderkolk says, and, and I don't know that I agree with him, but he says that we shouldn't start charging our clients for treatment until they feel safe with us. And so that, you know, creating safety, the client being able to feel safe within themselves is our most important goal before any of the therapeutic approaches can be used. So a little neurobiology of the brain, you know, we have three brains. So you have your first brain, which is this uh, brainstem, the primitive brain, the brainstem, diencephalon. The brainstem is what keeps us alive, keeps our heart beating, our blood flowing. The second brain, the limbic part of the brain, this is the emotional center of the brain. And then we have the thinking brain, the cortex, the prefrontal cortex, which encompasses about 40% of our brain. So 60% of our brain is about survival and emotions. And again, we have two hemispheres. So we have the right side and the left side. The right side is that emotional side, that um, artistic, intuition, creative side, and the left side is the logical, rational side. And so this is Dr. Perry's model. Um, and I heard him say one time when he was doing a presentation, uh, a group full of doctors, and he puts up this slide and someone raised their hands and said, I didn't know our brain looked like an upside down pyramid. Um, so I just always, have always thought that was funny when I look at this. So as you can see over here, our brain grows from bottom to top. It grows sequentially. So the bottom part is for our survival, our heart rate, our body temperature, sleep. And as we go up, the complexity increases, the plasticity increases. And so you can see like the limbic system is the regulation. And then the cortex is again that thinking. And so what happens when someone experiences trauma is again, this is what our, our brain should look like. The, our, the majority of our brain should be taken up with the cognition and the thinking. And what happens when someone has experienced trauma in childhood is it's inverted. And the survival function becomes the main functioning of the brain. So this, again, this person is always hypervigilant. They're always in this space of trying to keep themselves safe and regulated. So what gets impacted is social emotional relationships. They're being able to regulate their emotions, which means they're able to stay calm in situations. And then the cognition is negatively impacted. I had a client who was a fourth grader. And during the time that I saw this client, she felt very stupid. And her grades reflected that she, her, you know, she may have a lower IQ. And after working with her for a bit, what I realized was her mom died when she was five. And shortly after her mom died, her dad started sexually abusing her. And then her brother started sexually abusing her. So for years, she is being sexually abused by both the prominent males in her life. So she's sitting in the classroom being hypervigilant for every noise. Who's behind me? Are they going to hurt me? She can't pay attention to the chalkboard. She can't pay attention to the teacher's lessons because she's trying to keep herself safe. She's down here in survival, not being able to expand her brain, which is what school is for. And so that's what happens to someone when they've experienced this childhood trauma. 
And so you may be familiar with the terms regulation and dysregulation, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in some slides. So this is just a simple representation of showing the stress response. So a regulated person has a lot of space on the blue slide before they become dysregulated, before their state level drawer opens up. And I will tell you what that means in a minute. But we can handle a number of stressors before we blow. A person who is dysregulated, who has that childhood trauma, who is in that hypervigilant state, has a very small window of tolerance. So it typically only takes one or two things and they blow. And so they, these are the people who have those behavioral or emotional reactions. So there's two terms, there's hypoarousal and hyperarousal. Hypoaroused tend to be females, were withdrawn, depressed. It shows up as defiance, but defiance is more of a dissociation when you're hypoaroused. And then you have hyperaroused, which tend to be more males, which they're angry, they're aggressive, they're hyperactive. And then responsive is when we're able to stay engaged and focused and calm. So these are the, the two terms that we want to help clients do. We want to be able to help them recognize when they're dysregulated and how to heal that, and then how to help them be regulated. And so I'm sure everyone has heard of fight or flight. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Siegel, Dr. Daniel Siegel, he's, he calls it freeze, flight, fight, or faint. And this says fawn. But we, the way our brain works is we freeze first. Is the saber-toothed tiger big enough to eat us or can we get away from it? And then we will run away and then we will fight back. And if the stress is too much, we will faint. And boys typically, especially boys who've had trauma, will go straight to fight. And Dr. Vanderkolk says childhood neglect can prime individuals to be on high alert their bodies tuned in to fight or flight at all times. So these are these people who grow up from childhood, then are the adults we're interacting with that, um, you know, what's going on in our society right now, people become very dysregulated. It doesn't take much for them to be outside of their window of tolerance. Okay, so in the brain, <clears throat> you have the amygdala. The amygdala starts working the second a child is born, and it's your threat response system. It's kind of your fear receptor. So it's always scanning the environment looking for fear. And the problem is, is it's not a good discriminator of what's a real threat and what is an imagined threat. And because of the way our brain works, we could all sit here for a minute and imagine the worst experience we had or a bad experience we've had. And the brain doesn't know the difference whether it's an actual event or it's a vividly created image. It doesn't know the difference. And so how the hippocampus and amygdala work together, the hippocampus is like the librarian of the brain. It stores all of that information, it tags it, it documents it, it puts it in files and folders where it's supposed to be. But when the amygdala starts this threat response, it's like the library closes the door and you can't access the information to know whether this is an actual threat or a perceived threat. And so that's how those two systems work together. The hippocampus actually does not start working. It doesn't come online in the brain until a child is 36 months old, three years old. So the primary caregiver is the regulator for that child. And so you can see if the primary caregiver is very structured and consistent and nurturing and caring, the brain pattern is gonna be structured and consistent. If you have a very chaotic and inconsistent caregiver, the brain pattern for that child is gonna be inconsistent and unstructured. So trauma triggers, I have a 
a couple of statements. I have one client who came in for um, the death of her child. And what we work on most of the time is that she was repeatedly raped by her um, uncle for five years. She came in and said it was only one time. And then she's been able to realize that it went on for years. And so these are, she emails me after each session. And so she's, I'm just going to read you a couple of the things she said. And these are trauma triggers. I struggle with self-harm. Twice in the last week, I've acted on them because I've been so overwhelmed with the internal pain. I try to downplay this because it's not hurting anyone else, just me. And this week, I drug my fingernails from my knees to my thighs as hard as I could, as many times as I could, leaving red streaks up my thighs, and it felt good. I feel anxious and insane whenever there's any volume in the house, the TV or the kids are playing or my husband is talking to me, even if something is frying in the frying pan or the dishwasher is running, I lose it and scream at everyone. I stood at the kitchen sink, shoving cake down my mouth as fast as I could. I was not even tasting the cake. I just kept shoving and shoving and shoving it till I could not feel anymore. Then after I ate the entire cake, my stomach was stuffed. I felt horrible, overwhelming, debilitating shame. This is a trauma trigger. This is what happens when clients are experiencing that trauma again. <clears throat> and I'm gonna, you can read through this when, if you get the PowerPoint presentation, so I want to get to other things. So Dr. Vanderkolk talks about our memories of our memories. And there's research that shows that we really only remember about 50% of what actually happened and the other 50% we make up. And as a therapist, it doesn't really matter because we all do this. And so Dr. Vanderkolk talks about how, um, you know, our, our memories are stored as sensory fragments and they're, they're, stored in our brain as images, images and sensory fragments. And so this is the way we need to heal them. We can't, you know, talking through uh, trauma doesn't really work in therapy because you're not addressing where the trauma is actually stored. And sometimes um, we, our trauma stories become changed. Each time we look at a trauma memory, it changes each time. Okay, so this is Dr. Perry's information. There are four levels of memory in the brain, and I share this with every single client. So we have, you just think of a four-door filing cabinet. So we have cognitive memory. Hopefully everyone's using their cognitive memory now. Hopefully I am too. And so this is just where all your facts and figures are. And then the second drawer as we move down in the brain is the emotional memory, this limbic system, emotional memory. And so if each of you think back to high school and think of someone's name, then you also have a feeling of whether you liked or didn't like that person. And so that's how those two drawers are connected. There's all the cognitive memories have emotional memories. And then as we sink further in our brain, we have motor memory or muscle movement memory. If you haven't ridden a bike for years, you can get on a bike and ride one. Um, have you ever driven somewhere and thought, oh, how'd I get there? It's because you went somewhere else in your brain, but your motor memory got you to where you needed. <clears throat> okay, so the very bottom level drawer is called state level memory. So this is where all of our prolonged, overwhelming, unpredictable events are stored. So any experience you have of prolonged, overwhelming, unpredictable events, Whatever you were seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, attached to that event and got stored in that drawer. And what happens is we have a triggering event, what it, like this person um, that I just read to you about um, sounds. So what happens is she, get she gets triggered and the monster comes out. She yells. And this is dysregulation. When, when the memories from our state level drawer come up, they get triggered and we have that behavioral or emotional reaction. And every human being has these four levels of memory. 
And depending on how big the trigger is, will depend on how big the emotional reaction is. This is total dysregulation. And we're seeing it now in our country. We see it, uh, I've seen it in my office. I've seen you know, people yell at my face. And so as a clinician, we have to make sure our own state level drawers cleared out so that we can always be present with other people when they're in a state of dysregulation. And again, with this, this is the four different types of memory and how trauma impacts those. There's too much on here to go through right now in the time that we have. So it will be available on the PowerPoint presentation or you can get it online. So Dr. Perry says that when an adult experiences a trauma event or events, that it can alter the brain, but for a child, the traumatic event may be the brain's original organizing experience. So it may be how all the synaptic connections are connecting in the brain, which will alter that person permanently. <clears throat> the effects of trauma on children is attachment, emotional regulation, dissociation, cognitive ability, self-concept, behavioral control. And so again, you can look at more of these. All right, so he says that not feeling, just feeling accepted, loved, nurtured, or attended to by a parent or caregiver can cause trauma. Childhood trauma changes the biology, the anatomy, and neurology of the human brain. So, you know, our brain makes templates. We don't have enough brain space to store every single picture of every single person we come across. And so it stores templates for faces, facial expressions, um, emotions, emotional and behavioral reactions and social functioning. And so with that limited capacity in the brain, the brain makes the decision. And so it stores things as, whether people are safe, whether they're harmful, whether they're good. So it stores it kind of like in a familiar good, familiar bad. And so one of the most destructive patterns of parenting for a child is inconsistency. If a parent is talking the talk and not walking it, or if they're saying one thing and doing something else, this becomes the most damaging for a child is the inconsistency. And I have even told parents before or caregivers that I would rather you be consistently bad than waffle back and forth because you're doing more damage to the child because they never know what to expect and that then creates more hypervigilance <coughs> excuse me so these are this is just a an example of what the child will express um it's hard for them to think, their heart rate's beating, their stomach hurts, there's trembling. So this is the symptoms of that trauma. And I'm gonna let you look at that for a minute as I grab a drink of water. I think this is a very important statement for us to recognize as clinicians that Children exposed to violence in their family show the same brain pattern as soldiers exposed to combat. Now, I just think it's such a powerful statement of what's really happening in the brain of our children. And I won't go over this either. So you have positive stress, tolerable stress, and toxic stress. And the most important component of this and how we handle that stress is whether there's a support system and a buffer. And when things become, if you have toxic stress, stress it means you don't have an adult that's safe and you don't have any buffers from that stress. And why I think it's important for us to understand the brain is because we look at symptoms. A lot of times, especially medical doctors, they're not trained to do an intensive history so they address the symptoms and this is how kids get labeled ADHD when when we do that extensive intake we discover 
that there's actually a trauma causing these behaviors. And when we address the trauma, the behaviors will go away. So how do we cultivate resist resiliency in our children? The brain works by patterned repetitive stimulus. So you have to do it repeatedly. You need to prevent relational poverty. So that it's creating that social, emotionally rich environment for kids. And Dr. Perry talks about how, you know, remember the brain model is that we have to help the child regulate first, which is the brain stem. Then we relate to them, which is the limbic system, the emotional connection. And then we can reason with them in their cortex and how they can change their behaviors. And so part of being sensitive to this, and I am not a real fan of the word trauma informed because I don't think it's enough. So I like to say for myself, I'm trauma immersed in that I really want to intimately understand how trauma impacts people and what it does to their brain. And Dr. Vanderkolk says that all clinicians should be doing limbic system therapy. That's not addressing their cortex because the trauma is stored in their body and their brain. So, um, you know, I know many clinicians who recommend yoga and patterned repetitive activities that stimulate their brain, somatic experiencing, that internal family systems. I'm a registered play therapist, so those experiential therapies, the play therapy, the sand trade, drama. Uh, so those are the therapeutic approaches we should be using with people who have experienced trauma. I'm an EMDR trained therapist too, which is an amazing form of therapy. All right. So I want you to just look at this for a minute. And I like this because um, for me, this represents what do we see? When we look at children and we look at behaviors, what do we see? And so you decide what you see and we can talk about this or you can look at it when you get the PowerPoint and, and see there's two pictures here. And so these are just some of my favorite books on trauma. And I know that was a really quick presentation. And so I will open this now for uh, questions. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. James. And I have some participant questions that I'm going to uh, read to you. Okay. But first, I want to comment on, on how valuable your presentation was for all of us, uh, beginning and, and including uh, experienced clinicians. And when you talked about, um, you know, how the, how the client perceives the trauma, I recall a, a, a client, an adult client telling me that she, quote, must have done something to have uh, uh, solicited this uh, uh, horrific behavior from her dad because her sister was much less physically and sexually developed. So therefore, she must be guilty. And, and she was willing to accept an alternative possibility that he knew she was less likely to say something mm -hmm. sister rather than bearing that guilt of I must have done something to to cause him to do this. Right. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons we wrote the book is just so somebody had different information that they're not responsible for adult behavior. Let me share some of the questions. Okay. Uh, here, uh, one person said that regarding the fight, you know, flight, freeze, they were unfamiliar with the term fawn. And what does that mean? And, and how, how does that, um, you know, work in terms of uh, a situation comparing to one, you know, how do you work with that in trauma? Right, that fawn and faint, like Dr. Siegel's faint, it's, um, when the trauma or the trauma memory is so stressful that that's a dissociation. Fainting from a situation is a dissociation. And so if you have a client who you're working with and dissociates, they're hard to work with because you have to do a lot of resource building and therapy takes much longer 
because they will just dissociate. They will just go away. You could be talking to them, you could be doing the work and they will just go somewhere else. And so being able to help them create some sense of safety, <coughs> excuse me, so they feel safe in their own body to be able to be present while they work through those memories. Okay. I hope that Thank helps. You. Um, one question is, how does the polyvagal theory fit with these states, with what you're discussing? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, the polyvagal theory, you know, the vagus nerve and the super highway. So if you think of the polyvagal theory as um, this massive nerve fibers in the gut and 90% of information comes from the gut up and it creates a peptide. And, and I know this is very, just very basic um, explanation of th that. And then from the brain, what happens is say you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, I feel anxious. Well, your um, gut makes a peptide of anxiety and it sends it up the superhighway to the brain. And then the brain goes, oh, I'm feeling anxious. I need to think an anxious thought which creates a neuropeptide and it sends it back to the gut. And so you've got this loop going on of these um, feelings and thinking and feeling and thinking. And so you have to be able to disconnect that super highway experience to help people, um, you know, change those feelings, the anxiety and stuff. And so EMDR is good at that, some um, other limbic system therapies to help people disconnect that and heal that polyvagal, you know, the super highway. Right. There are two questions that are related from different people. Um, one is, you know, what is the best way to, to treat trauma, EMDR, question mark, and you discussed that with Sam, you were hesitant because of their you know, state of mind and what they were dealing with. And, and the related question is then, then what steps would you do in therapy for someone like Sam who is so you know, dysregulated and uh, impacted by this at, at that time? Um, I, I think EMDR is an amazing form of therapy because you know, it works on the, the two hemispheres of the brain. And because whenever we have those um, experiences, we have the feelings attached to them, the senses. And what happens with EMDR is it takes those memories or feelings from the right side of the brain and moves them to the left. And in that bilateral process, it disconnects the emotion. So you still remember the events, you just don't have any feeling about them. And so that's why it's so powerful. Um, somatic experiencing is another great way of treating trauma. You have to do limbic system because remember this uh, four drawer filing cabinet, the issues are stored in that very bottom level drawer. And if you're doing top drawer therapy, if you're doing cognitive therapy, you're not addressing where the emotional part of the memories are. Um, and so with Sam, or anyone who has that severe of trauma, um, it, it was very slow. It was a very slow therapy. And I used the vibrating paddles that EMDR has. And so she would hold them and we would start our sessions talking about just random things, her day, her dog, she liked to hike and those things to calm her down. And then we would check her level of anxiety. And then if, if her level was low enough, we could then start addressing. And it, the way I viewed this with her is we had this center issue here, and then we had all these fibers out here. And so we would have to slowly start addressing these fibers and start from here. Other people who have better resources, we can just go straight to that and we don't have to worry about all of this because as we do the EMDR, all of this will be taken care of. But with her, it, it wouldn't. And like I said, sometimes all we would do is pace the playroom because her elevation was so high because she had been so triggered. 
And so teaching her some coping skills and things she could do away from therapy. We created um, some protector using some internal family systems and creating protectors so that she could create these protectors in her brain when she felt overwhelmed. So therapy with someone with that severe of trauma is really slow and um, the therapist has to understand that. I hope that helped. Yes, yes. There are a number of people who want to know how they might be in touch with you or look at your work. Can you share how, how they might do that? Sure. My, you can email me at info at drkellyajames.com. Thank you. One person is asking, you know, when you talked about trauma creating kind of an organizing structure in the brain. And uh, they discuss having colleagues who talk about, well, you know, with neuroplasticity, anything can quote change. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to this issue of neuro, uh, you know, neuroplasticity and how you see trauma work related to this? Sure. Uh, you know, the brain makes synaptic connections. You know, you've seen the, the, the images where it makes synaptic connections from memory. And it takes that patterned repetitive stimulus to make those synaptic connections. And, um, <clears throat> you know, originally, you know, 90s were the decade of the brain. And they thought the brain was just, you know, hardcore. Once it was there, it was there. And, you know, clearly over the years and decades, we've recognized that the brain is plastic. And so um, back in the 60s, there came a term and it's more pronounced now epigenetics. And epigenetics means above the gene. And it, it was thought that the DNA that we had was just the DNA that we got and we were just stuck with it. But now, um, epigenetics proves that our environment influences the connections in our brain and the DNA and the expression of the DNA. And so that's how I put that together in that helping people change that environment because our brain doesn't know the difference, again, from an actual event we've experienced or one we vividly create. And so a lot of times with EMDR, what I'm helping the client do is go back and create an alternate ending to what their experience was. Be able to confront the abuser, confront people who didn't protect them. And what that does is it changes the structure in the brain and that's how it heals those memories. And so then the brain is healed, the negative emotions go away. Thank you. You know, it's interesting, one question has to do with the, the guilt and shame over the, the trauma. And many, many years ago, I worked with an adult who, uh, partly because of her Catholicism was, uh, at least her you know, sense of it, could not get over the, the guilt, even though she had nothing to do with the abuse from her dad. And, and, and that's when I, I called in a, uh, a, a clergy colleague who was able to talk with her and had the, the credibility that mm -hmm. I have. Yeah. in terms of that issue. And I, so how, what have you found helpful with the shame and trauma, so, the shame and guilt associated with the trauma? Yeah, shame, you know, I don't know if anyone's read the book, Power Versus Force, but shame is like the lowest vibrational frequency of all feelings. And um, it is a hard one. It's like a cloak that encompasses people. And being able to get rid of that cloak, um, it's probably, if I could say this, probably the most difficult part of working with trauma survivors is getting rid of that shame. And I, have, I was abused as a child. And what I recognized is when I started telling my story, and I was in my 30s before I started telling it, the shame went away. So one of the things I do with working with clients is as much as they can tolerate having them tell the story over and over as they're healing it with the EMDR and, you know, then bringing in some logic to it because, you know, 
a child can never be responsible for an adult's behavior. And sometimes I have to say those statements over and over and over again before they internalize that and recognize that, that they are not responsible. But you're right, shame and guilt are probably the most difficult part of trauma work. And, and one of the questions deals with, you know, the, 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 the people in the lives of, of uh, an individual with, who suffered, uh, survived trauma in terms of uh, how you help them with uh, the intimacy and, and the connectedness without, you know, necessarily leading to them to always become activated by that as, and, and have panic about that kind of uh, closeness. Mm -hmm. That, again, is another difficult one. The lady I read about with the trauma triggers, that, that's what we're working on right now is because, you know, how is um, intimacy with her husband and what happened to her by her uncle, why aren't they the same? And it's being able to disconnect that in their brain. And we do many EMDR sessions in her being able to see the difference in her brain. <clears throat> and being able to confront the abuser and recognize that intimacy with her husband is a completely different thing. And it, it is a difficult thing. And the guilt, the other part that, um, especially sexual abuse experience is that our bodies are designed to feel and we don't have a switch on our body that says good touch, bad touch. So depending on the age, the body will respond the way it's designed to respond. And so, they, it feels good. There, there are things when this is happening that it feels good. And then there's another whole level of shame and guilt that go along with being abused. And so that's another layer that you have to help clear out for that client. Right. And, and related to that, you know, the woman I mentioned that I, I referred to a clergy colleague, she was in, engaged and um, struggled with whether to tell her fiance mm. about the abuse. And, and I discussed with her that, that if she didn't, the marriage would be in peril mm. because she felt like she was effective in some way. Right. And that once, and that she was marrying him under, under uh, uh, deceitful circumstances. Right. And so sharing this with him was very helpful to her healing and, and really was helpful to their relationship. Um, it you know, and you bringing in a clergy, I think that's, uh, as clinicians, we need to be well informed of all the resources available and bring those people in and, and use as many different resources as we can to help a client be able to live the life they want to live. Right. And here's a question for you about, um, now that you know about trauma immersed counseling, what do you wish you may have uh, known way back? <laughs> um, uh, oh, gosh. Um, I first started out working with children. And my very first client was a selective mute four-year-old. And I, at the time, was very cerebral you know, and um, not that I'm not now, I just know better. <laughs> I know how to interact with, with people differently, but um, I, I didn't know that I couldn't just talk to this child about what happened. And so I made a statement and children, when you have gotten too close to their stuff, will move as far away from you as possible. So this kid crawled under the table to hide from me. So what I wish I had been more informed about, because I was fresh out of school, was I wish I had had some books like The Whole Brain Child or, you know, the Trauma and Memory book by Levine. I wish I had read those or known about them so that I wouldn't have um, expected things from this client that he was incapable of doing. Sure, sure. And, and can you comment, there are some questions on um, um, racial trauma and cross-generational trauma from prejudice, discrimination, mm. 
things that folks uh, deal with and, and gets uh, transmitted in some ways across generation through experience and, and history? Uh, so I, a, a few years ago, for probably about eight years, I've been really immersed in um, quantum physics, reading quantum physics, learning more about quantum physics and understanding our ourselves and our universe's energy. And I was reading a book called It Didn't Start With You. It's on this page right here by Mark Wolin. And it's an excellent book on transgenerational trauma, the transmission of it from one generation to the next. And when I was um, reading that, my friend said, oh, you need to read The Emotion Code. And The Emotion Code is how, uh, by Bradley Nelson, and he talks about how emotions get trapped in our body, even generationally. And so if there's that generational transmission from uh, racism and all of those things, the emotion code is an excellent way to discover things that are trapped in our body and release them. And it's a fascinating form of therapy. And I only got like partway through the emotion code before I paid for the certification because it, it just resonated with me. And I think probably because of all the quantum physics I'd read, but we can, you know, our subconscious mind is our supercomputer. It's recorded every single thing about us from conception to present day. And we can ask through kinesiology muscle testing, we can find out things that are trapped in our body and we can release them. So that's, that would probably be my first go-to if someone came to me with those issues. Yeah, and I think, I think what you're talking about relates to another question that had to do with um, children of parents immersed in trauma, mm. you know, yes. who have uh, PTSD. Can the children of these parents exhibit trauma as well? And I think you're addressing that issue there. You know, it's an interesting question from someone who discusses being an actor and <laughs> wanting to know if there are books or studies on how actors can, I guess, safely access or create certain moments and then return to themselves, so to speak. And I see this as having implication for what we do in therapy in general, helping people to access difficult things and then in some ways return to a, 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 a position or a feeling of safety. You know, one of the things I do with, with um, clients is with EMDR is creating a container. I have a container uh, I have people who have really, really stressful jobs. Um, and so we create a container because again, your brain doesn't know the difference between an actual experience or one that's vividly created. So when you vividly create a container and for me, I hear the stories, the client stories, and then I put them in this container so that they don't consume me. And I have clients who've created this container. They put it at the back door before they leave their office in the evening and that helps them be themselves but still have the information they need be hard for an actor for sure one of the things i wanted to say about <clears throat> the transmission is if each of you think about your grandmother and when she was pregnant with your mom at five months gestation, each of us were there too. Because at five months gestation is when the, the eggs form in a female fetus. And so whatever ever grandmother was experiencing went through the umbilical cord, into the fetus, into the um, eggs. And so that's the transmission of experiences. And so you can heal that, absolutely. And the last question uh, a couple of people has, have asked about because of uh, parental problems and, and pathology, the issue of, of uh, rejection in childhood mm -hmm. and how, how you see that playing a role in, in trauma and, and working with people who have that uh, significant rejection. Yeah, rejection is a, a, a huge trauma issue. Um, and... 
you know, again, like we each have our own perspective and what I do with clients with EMDR is <clears throat> I call it timeline. So we focus on that feeling of rejection and we get the distress scale. How distressing is this when you think of rejection and where do you feel it in your body? Because, you know, our body stores that. And then I call it timeline. So we go back in our timeline, <coughs> excuse me, to the place you first remember feeling that rejection. And because if you think about us putting up binoculars, this is what we see. This is our perception. And so when we go back and look at memories, we're able to see the whole picture and being able to see the reason that person rejected us. And that, again, we, we talk to that person, we find out why, but being able to see sometimes, and I know this sounds really weird until you've done it, but it, bringing in the adult self, this is the parts therapy that you do that I intermingle with EMDR. And so you bring in the part that sees the whole picture of why that person rejected you. Was that person rejected? And so they don't know how to accept. And it just, what it ends up doing is it creates an awareness and an acceptance and it heals that so that that rejection isn't as painful. And then you just start, you know, because our memories are in synaptic connections in a neural network, when you clear a big memory, it clears all the ones that are on that network. So you don't have to do every single memory. Um, so it just heals the person and that just doesn't feel as intense anymore. Yes, thank you. Yes, I, I've shared with, with certain, some clients that uh, there's no such thing as a bad infant. And, uh, and, and uh, sometimes that can help with that perception. Well, I want to thank you very much. Uh, this has been a, a terrific presentation and, and appreciate your time and answering people's questions. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from folks and, and events will in terms of uh, information from you. So I want to uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and um, um, and uh, thank you all who have participated. We had a, have a great group here. So thank you so much, Dr. James. Thank you.